<laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon. I know we have a lot of different time zones re represented here today. This is the, you know, the beauty of the, the intention behind this class, right? This is, uh, we're trying to, uh, to daydream big about what the, the future may, may, may hold for us. Uh, it's a very complicated topic with a lot of interesting things to, to think about. And so, you know, Limitless Space Institute, uh, uh, we had an opportunity to partner with uh, the Initiative for Interstellar Studies, uh, Rob Swinney and his team, uh, to pull together a, a full week-long class, kind of with a focus on uh, interstellar studies. It's just not a very common thing that you see. Uh, and so it was uh, when, when Rob and I started talking about this uh, quite a while ago now, Rob, uh, you know, we wanted uh, uh, we wanted this to be a very uh, gritty and, and detailed class, and that's uh, definitely uh, right up the alley of the uh, the I4IS team. Uh, I4IS has a long history uh, of trying to do very technical and gritty classes and, and engaging uh, uh, you know people from kind of all walks of uh, of um, where they are in terms of their career. Uh, so there's going to be plenty of good. Uh, uh, material for uh, everybody to digest. And I know it'll probably be, people will be thinking about this class uh, months or years from now, some of the tidbits that they pick up uh, uh, from this class. And so I, you know, I, I know this is definitely a, a labor of love for, you know, Rob and, and John and uh, Amelia and, and all the folks at uh, I4IS. Uh, uh, so it was really exciting to get a chance to partner like this and, and pull together this uh, week-long class. And this certainly fits within the the realm of what uh, Limitless Space Institute is about, right? Uh, our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to, to travel beyond the solar system and to support the research and development of enabling technologies. So this is this is all about that inspire and educate, uh, and we are a doing organization. So let me uh, I'm going to share just a couple charts, and then I'm going to uh, get off the stage and hand the microphone to uh, Rob so he can uh, start on the, the course material. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> yes. So welcome everybody to the interstellar class. Uh, again, partnership between LSI and I4IS. Um, you know, this is a, a great opportunity. We're looking forward to it. Uh, but just a little bit about uh, Limitless Space Institute uh, uh, to let you know a little bit more about us. Um, you know, our, uh, as I said, our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to travel beyond the solar system and to support the research development of enabling technologies. Our pinnacle objective uh, our North Star is to try and work towards enabling interstellar travel uh, by the turn of the century. And that is an absolutely difficult goal, um, but uh, it's certainly one that's uh, noble and uh, worthy of pursuit. And so a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear today is going to be tracing to uh, what's necessary to make that kind of a thing work, right? When you, when you talk about sending humans to the outer solar system or one day onto the stars, it's very different from anything we think of today. Uh, in terms of space exploration, right? The, uh, the energy requirements are in a, a whole nother zip code, if you will, right? So we, we, uh, we've got rovers on the surface of Mars. We're gonna be sending humans uh, back to the surface of the moon with Project Artemis. Uh, but if we wanted to send human beings to uh, Saturn in 200 days, the Delta V uh, that's necessary for something like that is a whole order of magnitude higher than the Delta V that's necessary to uh, uh, take a payload from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit. And so chemical propulsion doesn't, doesn't solve that problem. We have to have alternate forms of power propulsion. And so, you know, part of what you'll be hearing over the, the next few days is uh, some of the different aspects of not only the power propulsion, but communications and thermal and all the other things that are necessary to make something like this work. Uh, but from the, the time distance perspective, right, uh, uh, there are kind of three ways we can potentially tackle this uh, spanning a, a, a spectrum of uh, known to unknown, and this uh, this little chart is a chart we use a lot to try and help to briefly communicate that to, to folks that uh, uh, have interest in this. Uh, from what we know, right, uh, in terms of physics and engineering, uh, we could potentially utilize something where you've got a, a nuclear reactor uh, coupled to some type of form of electric propulsion. You see there on my little infographic I'm showing you, you got the little red spot that's like the core, that's uh, fissioning uranium, it's feeding electricity to some electric thrusters. Uh, and so this type of an architecture for moving large masses, if you will, uh, this can move uh, human beings to every destination in the outer solar system. It's been documented in the literature. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily give us interstellar per se. It can give us interstellar precursors out to about 1,000 AU. Uh, now, if we, if we kind of change power to, uh, uh, instead of 
fissioning uranium, what if we burned deuterium and tritium uh, in the form of a plasma uh, and change the power source from fission to fusion? We could increase the power level, um, uh, you know, non-trivially at least. Uh, and so fusion, uh, fusion electric propulsion or direct fusion, that's often discussed in the literature as a way to uh, send human beings to another star system. I know Rob Swinney and a lot of folks at I4IS uh, uh, had a lot of uh, challenging work that they did with uh, Project Icarus, uh, which was an interstellar type of mission using uh, some fusion approaches to do interstellar missions. And I'm quite confident that that may come up in the course of the, the, the conversation over this week. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's known physics, but not quite known engineering. Um, although I think fusion may be closer than, than people, people realize. Uh, and then we get into the fully of the unknown into the breakthrough category where we're on the frontiers of both physics and engineering. Uh, you know, we, we, quantum mechanics gives us a good understanding of the microscopic world and general relativity gives us a great understanding of the, the macroscopic world, but those two theories are not uh, completely compatible. Uh, so that tells us there's a little bit more generalized understanding to be developed. Uh, and so in the process of trying to work, out, work on the frontiers of physics, maybe we can figure out some way to actually interact with uh, the quantum vacuum or space-time or whatever it's made of, we can find some way to attractively impart momentum onto this background field and generate a force. Uh, we know that from general relativity that the idea of a, a space warp in a wormhole is mathematically possible. We don't explicitly know what to build and to, you know, utilize for, for some type of a concept like that. And so breakthrough may provide us uh, the ability to do fast interstellar one day where it uh, maybe it doesn't take a, a full you know, century to, to get to one of our, our stellar neighbors. And so that's kind of the, that's the, that's the how chart uh, uh, in terms of some things that we could bring to bear. Um, we here at Limitless Space Institute, we're a doing organization. Uh, as I said, we, uh, we support the research development of enabling technologies. We do that internally through our Eagle Works labs. Uh, we're currently funded by DARPA Defense Science Office doing some frontiers of physics work. Um, you can see more about that uh, in some, some, uh, 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 talks that I've given that are uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, we fund research externally through our Interstellar Initiative Grants Program. Uh, we funded nine researchers from across the globe covering topics from beamed energy propulsion, relativistic solar sails. Uh, we funded four teams doing fusion propulsion, uh, two on space drives and one on wormholes. Uh, this is in partnership with Texas A&M and Breakthrough Initiatives. Uh, we intend to do this uh, every two years. So this is something we want to continually do to provide opportunities for the community to go try and do some uh, really credible and, and gritty work uh, uh, and just, you know, maybe grow uh, the body of, of knowledge that's out there. Uh, we do university partnerships. We currently have a, an active program with uh, Texas A&M to develop a compact nuclear reactor uh, that would fit in a 40-foot conix container, about 1 to 10 megawatts electric. So that's uh, uh, the leftmost swim lane, if you remember, that I just showed you guys. Uh, we have student programs, and this is what we're doing here today, right, with this class. This is part of that, uh, uh, that category of things. We want to be able to host interns and graduate students and, and sponsor postdocs. Uh, and then, of course, pull together summer courses. And this is uh, kind of the, the Mark I uh, opportunity for us to do that uh, we're doing with uh, I4IS and uh, as part of what you're doing this week. And, of course, education outreach. So, you know, that's, uh, that's us in a nutshell. And you know, in, in terms of our brief existence, we've, we've only been going just under two years and we, these are all the organizations we have formal agreements with that we are doing, uh, we, we are doing work, we are committing resources and energies. Uh, and so we wanna continue to, to grow this list uh, as we continue to move forward. So I think with that, Rob, I'm gonna happily hand the microphone back to you and, and wish you well. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing and hearing all of this good stuff. So uh, Rob, you have the con, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Sonny. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, a very nice introduction. Okay, so that's the course. You've seen that already. And um, I'm going to go straight on with the background. Uh, yes. I don't know if you're familiar with with the very helpful Zoom system, it tries to help you automate everything, but actually just makes it um, a little bit more complicated. So welcome to the 2021 summer course. Um, as Sunny was saying, our aim, and it's the aim for I4S as well, is to educate and inspire. This is not 
it really is not meant to be the totally traditional teacher student type course but in many ways the conversation where you know which each person of, of you where no matter where your starting point is and that we appreciate that may be different for different people gain or at least move on in in your knowledge and understanding I, that did get me thinking that to remind you that this is the target audience for the material we originally created was fresher year, first year university STEM, STEM type students. We've broadened that a little bit, but that still was the sort of the direction we were traveling. So I, I imagine none of you will have great problems with the, the maths and the, uh, and the things that we're going to go through this time or the math that we're going to go through. But if you do, we'll help help you move on with, in your particular way, whichever, whatever is needed. So we're looking forward to helping you out with that. So introduction and background. I'm going to start off by telling you a bit about myself because you probably know Sonny, but you may not know me. I'm a retired Royal Air Force squadron leader. Um, I was an engineering officer. My primary specialist was Aero Systems Avionics. I did 20 years for that. But before that, I was a former uh, a teacher of craft design technology at, uh, at a school. Did that for a few years. Found I couldn't live off the pay, so that's why I joined up at the time. And before that, in the 1980s, I did my, my university studies. Um, my, my undergrad courses were uh, astronomy and astrophysics. I went on to the master's degree at radio astronomy at uh, Joddle Bank, that's the University of Manchester in the UK. And a couple of years later, after my a few years teaching, I went back and did an engineering degree at Cranfield University in avionics and flight control systems. So that's me. But when I left the Air Force, I was in a very fortunate position. I didn't have to work for a living anymore, which is very nice for various reasons. And um, I thought from now on, I'm just going to be a consultant and I will only do the stuff that I'm interested in. And I got very lucky and I spend a lot of my time involved with I4S with all of the, the fun stuff that, that we get to do, which is, uh, which is, which is, I'm very fortunate, but that's, uh, that's worked out for me. So here I am and I'm going to share some of that background and knowledge with you while we're here. You've heard about LSI, uh, Limitless Space Institute, but I will, I will give you some background, certainly starting from I4S point of views. We've got all the learning outcomes we hope that you will take away from each lesson. Um, you can tell us if we're off, off uh, the track a little bit when you finish the lesson. I suspect usually you might have to uh, hear the lesson, refer back to the slides, we'll PDF a copy to you all so you can go back and look at them. And after that, you should at least uh, understand or comprehend the learning outcomes that we spell out at the start of each session, or they should be there at the start of each session. So that's today. Introduction. Where are we then? I always start with this slide because you and me and the people like we want to be, we need to be involved, need to think on long term. Most people really, really get stuck just thinking about short term, pay back at the end of the week, pay back at the end of the month. And we need to change that thinking. And effectively, that's what we're trying to do with you today. To have more people thinking long term because we underestimate what we can accomplish in those timescales. I love this slide because one of my colleagues, i s colleague, his grandmother was alive in 1903 when the Wright brothers first flew their heavy than flight air flight in 1903. She was also alive to see the moon landings in, you know, 70 years later or less than 70 years later. But in a hundred years, we've gone from some guys in a workshop over the winter, messing around with bits of bicycle, bits of cloth to the International Space Station. That's really where we need to be thinking. But let's start with I4S so you know about the organisation a little bit too. Um, we're really a spin-off, and some of you may have heard of the British Interplanetary Society, which is an organisation that's been around since the 1930s in its format and uh, is an advocate for all things space. And we really spun off there 10 years ago, approximately, to look at uh, the challenges of interstellar. You'll recognise some of the mission there, which you may have seen, which sounds very familiar to LSI. So we're really uh, we're almost together on those two things, which is great. And we were a formal foundation in 2012 and registered as a UK not-for-profit in 2014. I mean, we're also registered in the 
uh, US as the Institute for Interstellar Studies. You might see that in some places, but the sort of lead organization really is the Initiative for Interstellar Studies. In the UK, we're not allowed to use the term Institute until we prove that we're worthy of it. So, you know, no, new organizations don't get that sort of that joy. And we are we're planning to apply any day now to say we've now proved that we're worthy of the term Institute and we'll all become the Institute for Interstellar Studies. But that's still uh, still to happen. There's a whole list of accomplishments. Now, I usually go through some, but I'll just mention that um, things like our Starship Engineer short courses, one or two day courses. Some of that material is filtered into this course, not all the same, but some of it's filtered in. They've been very successful, just one or two day courses. And we've also, over the last four, five years or six years, I've lost track now, except for one year, we have hosted the Interstellar elective module at the International Space University. That's a two week teaching package teaching the master's student course there and they get to choose if you know if they like what we're offering what uh, what courses they do as the um, elective module so we've we've done that very different from this material in in some ways um, and some of it again the same so you'll 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 hear us talk about that as we go through some of the things we do i usually just say really there's four pillars to i4is education technical um, sustainability and enterprise and there's people who look after all those aspects I mainly look after the educational side and I mainly get involved with with the universities John who's on board with us at the moment is one of my right hand people who looks after a lot of the school work and outreach that we do and does a great job there there's there's projects we do we'll come on to some of them and there's other events we run which you, you'll hear about Certainly, I mentioned this one project, Dragonfly. It's always interesting because we came up with Dragonfly in 2013, 2014, which was just an overall concept work to think about using laser beam driven cell probes to go into cellar. And we ran a competition. We ended up with four university teams who, um, who went through that uh, competition. And it was the Technical University of Munich that won, won it. And, and um, I'll come back to that in a moment. But falling out of that was some future work came Project Glowworm, which was going to be a first test of a laser push sail in orbit. So can we test the principle in orbit? And we're working on that at the moment. And Lyra, you'll hear more about as we go through. So I'll, I'll just go on from there. We do a lot of outreach. I show this picture just because myself and Kelvin, Kelvin Long was one of the co-founders of I4S. And we've done lots of talks at various places like this was a, a sci-fi convention uh, in this case we're talking about looking at science fiction starships how they work or how they don't and um, I always say uh, thanks to Kelvin a lot of the material that you see that I do will have appeared through him or from his book uh, Deep Space Propulsion which you can get to see through Springer um, there you go as I mentioned we do a lot of schools outreach and we've been fortunate for a couple of years to do outreach at the Royal Institution in London with uh, our one occasion 13, 15 year olds, another occasion 16 to 17 year olds and teach them about, uh, the, you know, effectively look at uh, how the con conservation of momentum and forces as you step off a skateboard is basically the same as rockets. And then we, we take them through the, the process of thinking uh, about those, those things, which is really, really good. So where have we ended up today? We've now created this course for, for you. Um, this is the course as it stands for this week. So it's, it's different from the one in the event, right? Which if you want to review back through and look at that one again, that is in fact the sort of hypothetical ideal run through that we hope to do. We've had to rejig that a little bit to fit availability of speakers and all sorts of issues to get the current um, schedule you can see here today. But if I... Um, I'll bear with me if I just zoom in you've got basically the daily themes is the key things we've tried to have an introductory day uh, we've had um, the propulsion day which is tomorrow systems day concepts and designs and then ad astro is the last day where we just look we should be looking at just the future and there's a and we tried to follow those today they, they haven't fallen perfectly in the practical course that we've got through this time so bear that in mind when you're when we're trying to go through the program 
you know almost each lesson could could be taught well not almost most of the lessons could be taught maybe over a term or even a whole university year so somehow we've had to fit that into an hour and a half or less uh, abridge the information to make it fit but still try and lay those foundations for you you know there could be there could be a little bit of repetition which is partly on purpose i asked the lesson creators to consider keeping in mind that the time in the course might not work out for your thing i was totally right there and um keep their lessons broadly independent and not rely on the teaching order so you know that might be different if we had an in-person course we could order much easier so you may see a little bit of repetition but but in my mind that's quite useful as reinforcement not just repetition if there's too much please let us know if there's too little let us know okay the next stage is just to talk about uh, the background so I don't know how many of you have thought about the background to interstellar studies and the very deep space flight that we're interested in today. But I like to think of the modern era starting about 1952 with this article in the Journal of the British and the Interplanetary Society by uh, uh, Les Shepard. And um, I mean, there is a bit of history before that, which I'm actually going to cover tomorrow with uh, in the electric propulsion mainly because Angela who wrote that lesson has left a bit in there so there will be a bit in there so we'll, we'll come back to that but the modern era I think of 1952 when Les Shepard wrote this article when he looked at all of the fundamental issues that would need to be solved and put them down in the paper and, and published and this is when it really kicked off a new era of looking into the possibility of going into deep deep space and we got the famous red covers of the uh, JBIS, the Journal of British Interplanetary Society. So it's normally a, normally a nice blue colour, but the red colours, the red covers are, are famous because they became the interstellar issues and you may see them around, them around and you still see them occasionally now, um, which is great. But look out for that. I like to introduce some of the pioneers other than Les Shepard, you know, people like Dr. Robert Forward, you know, his comment is going to be difficult, expensive, but it can no longer be considered impossible is very, very true today. It was true then and it's it's true now. And, I, and Arthur C. Clarke has this quote, which I see a lot. You know, many conservative scientists appalled by these cosmic gulfs have denied they could ever be crossed. But I'm totally with him on that last line. No fundamental scientific laws oppose its realization. Then sooner or later, it will be achieved. Now, I'm obviously hoping it's sooner rather than later. Um, I'm sure you are too. And I like to make the point about, uh, you can almost call things like this uh, project, the X-33, as standard aerospace engineering. So designed using system engineering approach that you all will be either familiar with or will become familiar with in your careers. The key point is we can do the same thing with deep space or interstellar spacecraft. And this image here is of the British Interplanetary Society 1970s project. I'm sure most of you have heard of Project Daedalus, where they came up with the idea um, for fusion powered starship. This was an exercise in extreme aerospace engineering. Starships and those deep space uh, craft can be designed using system, a systems engineering approach. And that's what we tend to promote all the time. So what have we achieved in the past? I, I like to just reflect on what we have achieved and I think back to some of the historical missions because in theory Pioneer 10 and Voyagers are our precursor interstellar missions but in the 1950s some people thought with chemical rockets if you just look at the performance of chemical rockets we were never going to get beyond Mars never there was no chance of it just the performance was not good enough and you know although in in the 19th century there was there were studies of comets passing Jupiter and that had shown that their orbit could get changed and they could actually gain energy no one knew how that might be possible to achieve using something similar with spacecraft and the story i have is a young ish student a ucla graduate student working part-time at jpl finally solved that three-body 
problem for spacecraft and figured out how to use these gravitational assists that then took us with chemical rockets beyond beyond Mars. And we've been sending spacecraft to the outer planets and elsewhere ever since using gravitational assists. This is a, I think Pioneer 10 with the kickstage quite visible there. Um, one of those early interstellar precursors as we talk about. And then there's Voyager. I bring up Voyager because this is really what brought me into the world of space and space science. I, I was a young man, young child young man when uh, the Grand Tour took place and I was absolutely fascinated by it. And these were our first effectively, eventually interstellar ex explorers. They're still working and outside of the sun's heliosphere. But originally they were just designed really as planetary observers fly by where, you know, with the appropriate equipment. They're not really into, you know, for instruments for studying the interstellar medium. And now, of course, they're very, uh, very low power. So, you know, they won't last much longer. And I mentioned some orbiters like Cassini Huygens, because as I always want to point out, what when we talk about going into deep space, I do not any, in any way want to denigrate what they achieved in the past. It is absolutely amazing. And this is an example of an absolutely amazing um, system. Cassini Huygens with the lander on Huygens. Uh, just amazing, absolutely amazing. I always do, do poke fun at the fact they seem to put the worst camera on Huygens that was possible. But if you think about the way these projects had developed, the digital camera that went out there was was you know quite an early version and that's why the, the pictures are quite quite uh, low resolution but an amazing amazing uh, program but just to tease you a little bit i don't i can't see any of you at the moment because of uh, i've got a full uh, presenter's view this is an image of something from hubble does anyone know what it is let me see if I can get the chat screen up. Let's see if I want to do the discussion. No, I still can't see the chat screen. Uh, I will figure that out before the next uh, meeting or next presentation. It must be somewhere. And Amelia, if you have any ideas how to bring the chat screen up, all I can see is the presenter's view on my laptop and the image you guys are seeing on my monitor. So somewhere here, the chat screen must be, I must be able to break out the chat screen. Alt H. No, nope, still not visible. Well, I, I can see it, Rob. Can you? Lucky you. Any you any responses got from the comment so far? Sorry, John? You only got one comment. Ah, right, here we go. Uh, Chris says, no Jar Jar, whatever Jar, J-A-J, -A -J, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, Jeremy Lawson says, Mars, question uh, mark. Matthias, uh, um, I can't read the whole of his name. Uh, Jupiter, uh, Tim Blackman says, some galaxy. And Elena says, Pluto. Right, so well done, Elena. Full, full marks for Elena. So this is, that's the image of um, Pluto. Uh, the best image we could get from uh, Hubble and, and for a few years I used to show this cartoon of um, New Horizons arriving at, at, at Pluto and I, I started to get fed of it but fed up with it but eventually New Horizons arrived at Pluto in 2015 and we ended up starting receiving these wonderful pictures this is one of the first pictures I saw and it just just was amazing um, obviously the flyby by happened, it took 16 months to, to downlink the, uh, the information back to Earth, but it was just, just an amazing time. I don't know if you, if you uh, remember that. The Pluto system, what I thought was going to be just a, a, a rock like the moon with craters, turned out to be incredibly interesting. From the mountains to the nitrogen glaciers, um, all sorts of surprises. And it... it wasn't just that, it was just beautiful to see those pictures. And that one almost reflects the image you saw, or the blurry image you saw earlier. Um, and, and I'll show you some more images later, but uh, a lot more was to follow. It was just amazing. And the point 
I like to make is there's no comparison between the best images we can take with the best telescope we've got than in situ. I know it was only a flyby, but in situ observations. That's part of the argument we tend to use for continually pushing for further and deeper missions. Right, here's another one then, John. Maybe you can see if anyone comments on here. This is another image from Hubble. Let's have another, see if anyone can spot what this might be. While you do that, John, I'll see if I can figure out why I can't see the, it must be here somewhere. No comments so far. Oh, this is another image of a solar system object through from, from Hubble. It's not Mars, but sometimes it, I, I get the feeling uh, it might be Mars. But. Uh, right. Uh, just make sure I don't get the comments on the two separate things mixed up. So I'll, re I'll read them from the more. Uh, Matthias sure. Desmos, I think he means Deimos. Uh, uh, Sebastian says Jupiter. Uh, Chris says Jupiter. Amelia says Neptune. That's it so far. Ah, uh, Jeremy says one of the outer planet moons. Okay, well, in fact, it is Ceres in the a dwarf planet officially now in the in the asteroid belt. That's the best image we could achieve with our our, te our Hubble telescope. And when we were able to send a spacecraft, Dawn, the Dawn spacecraft. We then found we got these amazing images, and I'll show you some more of them in a, in a bit as well. Um, got some great close-ups, and we were able to orbit. The other object was the asteroid Vesta, and then Ceres. Here's a little you can see here. So we were able to orbit both bodies, which was the first time at the time. And and the and the the fact of the matter. This was a demonstration of what we could do with an iron drive, which you'll learn about tomorrow very low thrust, so in space only, but can operate efficiently for years and years, and was able to get us to orbit these two bodies. So, we mentioned what we'd like to do. What uh, we mentioned some early pioneers and some early thinking, not not much, just a, a few names and things. But uh, what were the early interstellar concepts and designs like? Well, first off, let's just remind you what I said earlier. I just threw it in earlier that um, in theory, Pioneer 1011, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons are our first interstellar precursor probe, probes. Voyager um, is out in the interstellar medium. New Horizons on its way. So we've basically sort of had 30 years of progress between these uh, uh, craft. And I imagine the systems are very, very different and the p computing power is very, very different. What do you notice when you compare the, th the five of them? I can see you, John, but I can't see anybody else, but I assume they're all still watching. You don't have to answer this question because I'm going to tell you, in fact, if you notice, effectively, the, the velocity we've achieved is, is no different in 30 odd years of, of development. And that's primarily because we're just basically using the same um, chemical propulsion systems, same uh, flyby uh, gravitational assist techniques. And clearly, if we want to go uh, deep into space, we're going to need more energetic and much more efficient solutions for getting there, getting farther and getting there quicker. And some people did think about these earlier on. And in those early 50s and 60s, you may have come, you may have heard about Project Orion, where this is a, a real project, uh, properly uh, written about and funded as on budget lines, paying for it. I think um, the USAF had a load of money in there at one stage to consider developing this principle and this was a craft effectively where you would drop and i'm going to say this once nuclear bombs out the back of your uh, spacecraft from now on there'll be nuclear units um, they would explode hit the pusher plate at the back of the uh, uh, spacecraft and push it forward transfer the momentum push it forward it was literally designed like a battleship 
Um, and and the thought of launching, launching this from Earth, I don't know how serious they were about that, but I can think you can probably imagine the problems with launching something like this from Earth. But it was properly designed. Now, I've heard two different stories about it, but I believe the original design was to see how we could get to somewhere like Saturn in months rather than years. That was the plan that they came up with this uh, Project Orion. There's another picture here I might show you a bit more closely. So you can see the eject the, the nuclear units out the back here and they would uh, impinge on the pusher plate and then transfer with shock absorbers and push the spacecraft forward. This was tested and you can see this online in principle using chemical charges and it, you know the principle is so easy you can see that it was obviously going to work and it's something that could still work today if if you imagine we might have the need for it at some stage and that might come up too there was other things like science fiction authors you might hear about this but uh, anyone seen the movie the 2001 space odyssey 1960s you know they put the ideas together like it's from arthur c clark it's called the discovery it was an interplanetary ship from the film it was magnetically confined fusion you'll hear about that using a tokamak type variety no uh radiators to get rid of the waste heat because reactors always create lots of waste heat you know apparently stanley kubrick the uh, director didn't want the the radiators because they would make it look like winged a winged spacecraft he wanted it to as you see there and interestingly you know a few a few years later in 2001 the team of guys from NASA Glenn at say Cleveland Ohio tried to put the the idea behind the discovery and came up with this this version of discovery and it's basically the same solution you know the long truss up here to separate passengers and crew a long way away from the fusion nuclear reactor and um, down there right here they've got fuel tanks this time and they've got these huge radiators which you need to get rid of the waste heat that's created by the the reactor so but they they seem to feel that they could come up with a a realistic uh, solution even though you know the the magnetically confined fusion tokamak didn't really exist in the in the uh, and the, in 2001 but that took it as far as they could so there's people thinking about this all the time and if you go back to the 1970s and I go back to the 1970s I usually mention this one because arguably the uh, Daedalus project from the British Independent Society was the most complete concept for a interstellar spacecraft ever done and I've not heard many people try to counter that argument um, you'll hear much more about that a bit tomorrow in propulsion and a bit more on Thursday when we talk about concepts and designs and there's been others and I will there's a large body of work over the years as I mentioned most of them not complete designs but uh, some more than others and we'll we'll talk about them as we go through the the week as Sonny mentioned I, I'll bring up Project Icarus because Project Icarus was really the follow-on in from from Daedalus so I was involved from the start with Project Icarus in about 2009-2010 when the members of the British Interplanetary Society were sitting around saying well we've had 30 odd years of development of nuclear fusion techniques shall we update the Daedalus design and we started updating it in collaboration with the as a word missing, that should be Tau Zero Foundation. I'm not sure what's happened there. It might be behind one of the images. The Tau Zero Foundation, which is a US not non-profit. So we're going to redesign. And like Sonny said, we'll talk all about that on Thursday. One thing we did differently from Daedalus, I like to point out, is Daedalus just imagined they were a few hundred years down the line, you know, and you could mine the atmosphere of the giant planets for the fuel and they didn't say how you would you would develop from where we were today to to where we were then and i and part of icarus was to come up with a sort of pathway steps to um designing a daedalus type mission you know as so we based it around uh, targeting distances 
and started with a pathfinder what we called was a basic um advanced vasimir effectively and then onto fusion drives um and that's how we showed that you could go there. I do remember giving a presentation once, and I think it was Sonny who came up to me and told me how, how much I was pushing the boundaries of reality. But uh, we, that was the design we came up with, and you'll hear more about that. Just a point to mention that those illustrate, illustrations are not relative to scale-wise. Actually, they're just uh, design-wise, but they're not to scale, those ones. The, the Pathfinder and the earlier uh, uh, Starfinder is much smaller than a Daedalus, much smaller. So what did we outcome from Icarus? Well, just jump to the end for Icarus and we came up with five variants. One of the most advanced was called Firefly and I'll be able to teach you more about that on, on Thursday. I'll go through more of that and you can ask a lot more questions then. I'm thinking I need a five minute break. So where were we? I just finished off with Project Icarus. I won't say any more there, Firefly, because we will come back to that on Thursday. The challenge with rockets, as, as you know, you have to take all that fuel with you. So some of the options that people talk about is not to go so fast, but maybe just take a slow boat to Centauri. And sometimes in these scenarios, and this one uh, I think came from Paul Gilster, um, Centauri Dreams originally, was just to think about we're going to slowly migrate to the outer solar system. And if, even if we never create some of these really energetic rocket type systems, we, all, we could still do it. We could build space colonies. We may take hundreds of thousands of years, but it will happen. So that's along the same principle of Arthur C. Clarke's comments. We will, we will get there, it will happen eventually. But it may take a long time. Some people not prepared uh, to wait that long, start to think of alternatives and they, they think about uh, solar sailing, which is to, to use that very, very light photon pressure, the pressure of the light uh, on your sail, just to push around the solar system. Now, now this will be useful because uh, unlike a rocket, you don't have to carry all the fuel, all the propellant. And it certainly seems like solar sails will be in the mix, in my opinion, for the inner solar system where the the sun light is still quite strong. So that will definitely feature. But to get them going any distance or into deep space into the outer solar system, quite clearly uh, the alternative is to is, uh, is a, use a, laser, a, be a beamer, a laser, a maser beamer to, to force the light onto the sail and get going faster and deeper into deep space. So there's another way of doing it. If you can't, if you just think eventually you may get there, but the rockets are so large, tens of thousands tons of fuel. We can't even collect the fuel. You know, this is an alternative way that may, may help achieve some of our goals in a different manner. I mean, it'll be interesting to discuss with you at some stage, which direction you think is most likely and what, in what uh, order things might happen. And in fact, there's a poll question I have tomorrow that asks that particular question. So we'll see where that goes. So that's some of the early concepts and you'll hear a lot more about them. But a key issue to discuss is, is the scale of the problem. I half anticipate that most of you will know all about the scale of the problem. But to, com to complete the package, it just seems wrong to miss it out. So I'm going to introduce some key features and other people will talk about them in um, other lessons as well. And I love to show this diagram. There's, there's updated versions of this all over the place nowadays. But I do love this image because it shows the, the problem quite well. So this is a logarithmic scale. And those of you not familiar, hopefully you all are. But the Earth is at one astronomical unit from the sun on that horizontal line there. Every step on a logarithmic scale going to the right is 10 times greater than the previous step. So Saturn is there at approximately 10 astronomical units. The edge of the heliosphere is just over 100 astronomical units. There's not a lot going out here at 1000 AU, but there may be. We can talk about that later. 10,000 AU, we're out in the clouds, or clouds and things. 100,000 AU, 
at the edge of the G cloud, perhaps. We're not too sure. And then Alpha Centauri is at around 270,000 astronomical units. And if you've never thought about those distances, it might become clear if you if you can imagine. Um, I know Sonny was at the ISU uh, just last week. The ISU is on the border between Germany on the right hand side and France on the left. Depending on which century it is, depends whether it's in Germany or in France, because they seem to change over every year. Although the region is region is uh, is called the Alsace region, where they have their own almost dialect almost. But there was Sonny last last week, and I've been to ISU quite a few times. Now, if you can imagine that one large stride of your step you could take was one meter, and you could travel at the same speed as those early interstellar probes that we talked about, which was two or three steps per year. That marker on that road mark on there is 270 kilometers away. At two or three steps per year, just imagine how long it would take you to get to uh, past Luxembourg City out on the motorway heading towards, uh, I don't know, Western France by the looks of sort of thing. That's the challenge we, we have. We, we, we literally can't get anywhere at two or three steps per year. You know, it, it would be nice to have a car uh, on the map there. You can see you can do it two and a half hours. And that's what Sonny's working on in terms of uh, hopefully with traveling faster than light options. But at the moment, we're looking at the more near future, perhaps, or the not the breakthroughs, but we're going to be looking at other ways of going faster, maybe not as fast as that car. So what does that come down to that the problem with that comes down to the ideal rocket equation or otherwise Tsiolkovsky's equation now this is meant to be just a brief introduction you the, the ideal rocket equation will come up again and again and hopefully most of you will be mo quite familiar familiar with this but I'll just mention it now so that we're we're all at the same we're near the same level and Tsiolkovsky came up with this formula in 1887 and applied to rockets in an ideal situation, you ended up with this simplified uh, equation here. And if you're, if you're not too sure, which I'm sure you, most of you are, the delta V here equals the exhaust velocity multiplied by the log natural, which is just a mathematical function, the log natural of that figure in the brackets, which is the initial mass over the final mass. The, the log natural just means do some to the figure in that brackets, which we'll, we'll work out, we can work out straightforwardly. That thing in the brackets, uh, M naught over M final, is sometimes known as the mass ratio, full mass ratio, sometimes written as just a capital R, and effectively reflects how much fuel is used to achieve your delta V. You know, it's the equation is almost like, I, I half jokingly say it's like the E equals MC squared equation for rocket scientists. It's an ideal equation because it leaves out many of uh, the factors and just assumes a single scenario. You know, deep space, no gravity, no atmospheric, no pressure to worry about. But it's definitely very useful as a first order calculation when you're thinking about in space propulsion. Now, a key point to think about here is the log natural. Because of that mathematical log natural function of the mass ratio, the delta V return for adding more and more fuel diminishes rapidly. What it means is that log natural of that figure increases, but only more and more slowly. Or well, another way of looking at it is the fuel or propellant requirement goes up exponentially to try and increase the delta V by adding more and more fuel. And we can get into the discussion on fuel and propellant um, during the week, but we'll we'll sort that out as well. So my question to you is what, if you haven't thought about this, what could we try instead of just adding more and more fuel? Well, it turns out because that uh, exhaust velocity is in there, and delta V is directly proportional to the exhaust velocity. If you can increase the delta, your exhaust velocity directly, you can increase your delta V much easier than just putting more and more fuel on. And, and hence, all this effort has been spent 
to find new ways of increasing increasing the exhaust velocity, which leads to a talk about the more energetic sources being required. And just for comparison, here's some figures I've put in a table that just illustrate the changes in the uh, amount of exhaust velocity as you go through these energetic processes. Iron, plasma, they're real figures effectively, the exhaust velocity, the fission, fusion, antimatter are theoretical figures at the moment. Um, we know more or less accurately what they might be. And I've added a column for the specific impulse and probably all of you have heard of specific impulse but I'll mention it again, it's related by that equation down here to the exhaust velocity and it's great for me to talk about specific impulse with Americans and Europeans is because there can be no confusion over the units which does happen occasionally. So I do like working with specific impulse because um, it's only seconds. Um, if you do talk to some UK proper real UK rocket scientists they do give me a hard time for using that because it's strictly it should be using uh, slightly different units but it's a it's very very common usage to use specific impulse in seconds and use that equation to relate it to the exhaust velocity. Now clearly there's a substantial difference in the nuclear and the antimatter figures there, substantial. So how much energy might it take just to just to put it in perspective, how much energy might be needed to for example, a one ton probe, 5% speed of light, the kinetic energy alone would be approximately 10 to 17 joules. And for example, the example I put there, shuttle launch is about 10 to the 13 joules. Now I did have this figure of the world energy consumption in 2008. So 10 to 17 is getting towards a fraction of the world energy consumption in 2008. Now I have checked the world consumption since 2008 and it's actually not that much higher in 2020 than you might think. So a one ton probe traveling at 5% of the speed of light is going to use the energy that's a significant, a small proportion, but a significant fraction of the world energy consumption. It's quite, it's a quite substantial. And you can see that from this table and I've just put the two tables down here. The bottom table reflects there's the proper relativistic, relativistic mass correction factor in the bottom table. But just you can pick out some size mass of your potential probe and the speed you'd like to go. And you can see immediately the, the energy levels that are required to um, to get there. And I've got you know, breakthrough star shot, grand payload, 20% of C, that's still, you know, 10 to the 13 joules, approximately. Daedalus second stage, 1,000 tons, under 1,000 tons, 12% of the speed of light, you've got uh, 10 to 20 joules. And for, for fun, sometimes you can is it fun? I'm not sure that it is. You convert that into equivalent tons of TNT just for comparison. You know, Daedalus is, is like a billion tons of TNT. It's an incredibly amount energetic, uh, just in kinetic energy. So, so that needs to be borne in mind. Other people have thought about other ways of projecting into the future when it might become possible to build and, uh, um, or have the technology to achieve interstellar travel. And in this graph, what it does is it actually uses speed as a sort of proxy for technology growth. If we imagine that over the longer term, the increased speed of our probes should go up uh, exponentially. Now, it hasn't done that in the past, of course, but if we're thinking about in space more broadly, it could be possible. And this could give some indication, uh, the example here, to get to 27, uh, 2,700, 2,700 AU per year 
to get to Alpha Centauri in a hundred years. So when might it be possible, at what level of growth or what level of increase of speed might it be possible to, uh, to get to, to that sort of figure? And you can, you can go along the graph yourself and maybe pick out different levels of growth and uh, when the year feasible might be for achieving a uh, interstellar uh, travel to the Alpha Centauri in 100 years little comment I've got here if you're wondering about the units so you know the speed of light is approximately 63,000 AU per year so the 2,700 AU per year turns out to be about just over 4% of the speed of light so that's the sort of speeds we're talking there and finally just thinking about um, thinking when we might be able to do this sort of thing some people have worked on estimates of world GDP growth. Um, hopefully they've ignored the last year of pandemic, but looked at figures of GDP growth to suggest when something like a Icarus or a Daedalus type interstellar mission might be affordable. And it usually works out at a couple of year, hundred years time. Now you can play around with these figures but I'm, I've never been totally convinced about these estimates, um, financial, energy, speed. How I've never been convinced totally by how much they might relate to when we really go into stellar. I'm probably a bit biased, but I always think it's a little, it will be sooner. Most of the answers always come out about 200 years time. I don't know why that is, but that's the, typically what people's estimates do where it's it's a bit of crystal ball gazing in my mind but effectively on this one I, I should have said so how much money we could afford the comparison is if you imagine how much it cost for the Apollo program how much if in the future does the GDP have to grow so that we could afford to, to generate a program like a Daedalus or an Icarus and this that comes out I don't think the figures on there but it turns out to be 2200 you know the year 2200 something and I guess I'm biased because I hope there will be breakthroughs and disruptive technology engineering that comes along or maybe an interstellar version or deep far solar system Elon Musk will come up and, and we'll really get much further than than anticipated. We'll have some later on today. Robert Kennedy will talk a bit more about this in a bit more detail. So um, he's got some some great thoughts about the power requirements and costs that he'll he'll explain later on today. I am going to just try to summarise what we've talked about today. So you've heard about I4IS and our mission which is very similar to LSI you know we've been working on eight years we'll hopefully become an institute at some stage you've you've heard about thinking about the the early pioneers thinking about early projects that might work and how we've we stumbled along trying to think of some of those and then we've looked at some of the earlier missions that might be equated to uh, interstellar probes and not really but you know we can do that sort of thing and we've been through all that and what you'll find over the rest of the today tomorrow and the rest of the week is we'll fill in those details a bit more so there'll be a bit of overlap reinforcement but we'll fill in those details and that's the whole whole idea a reminder of these two quotes it still looks difficult and expensive but no longer considered impossible and there's still no fundamental scientific laws opposed to realization. So sooner or later, according to Arthur C. Clarke, we will, it will be achieved. I hoped a lot of these things were going to happen 40 years ago, what you see today happening. So those guys starting out on their careers now in a very lucky position, a very fortunate position. We've, you've jumped 40 years in, in, the, in progress in the last few years, really. 
um, and I'll explain why after lunch. But uh, I wanted just to reiterate, there's just been a long history of people thinking about space and interstellar travel and a lot of ideas, some more detailed than others, but a lot of ideas. The problems seem to be challenging, but given time, we will achieve it. So let me look back at the learning outcomes. Hopefully you feel you've covered some of those. Like I say, it might take a little bit of reflection on the notes or, or on the rest of the things you hear over the week to fill in some of these gaps, but hopefully you feel you can, you can talk through some of them. But I always like to finish on a slide a bit like this. The universe is exploring for exploring. It's time for us, especially you youngsters, to get out there and uh, maybe not on a galactic scale, but certainly into the near, uh, definitely into the far solar system. I am utterly convinced that the inner solar systems can be cracked in a few years with Elon Musk and the rest. And in a couple of decades, we'll be working on the far solar system and possibly beyond, you know, maybe even with a breakthrough star shot. Um, event going all the way. Now I've got the end of session.